love balloons. <laughs> I'm Ruth Werner, and this is my um, audiovisual sidebar to my article, When You Can't Catch Your Breath, that is in the July-August 2019 edition of Massage and Bodywork magazine. My article in this edition focuses on COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, with a special emphasis on the pathophysiology of this condition. That is what happens to bring these uh, problems about, but especially on the role of massage therapy for clients who live with COPD. And for this, I was honored and grateful to have conversations with several people who live with this condition or who have clients with this condition. So the article is really richly um, informed by their generosity. Um, before we continue, I also want to let you know that I live with a little chronic cough. <laughs> like that. I don't have COPD or a lung disease. I have a, a different situation going on, but talking about breathing and lung issues and blowing up balloons and things can be a trigger for me. So I'm going to try and keep that to a minimum, but just to let you know, you know, that's what my situation is. To understand what goes wrong with COPD, it is helpful to review how the respiratory system works when it's healthy, and that is the focus of this video. So the easiest way to discuss the structure of the respiratory system is to take a deep breath. <clears throat> we draw air in through the nose where it encounters mucous membranes that line our sinuses and the tubes that go all the way down into our lungs. The wet, sticky, warm, snot-making membranes in the respiratory system are responsible for conditioning and filtering the air that passes by. Once past the nose and the mouth, air enters first the pharynx and later the larynx and then the trachea and the left and right bronchi. The bronchi divide into the bronchioles, which then separate out and terminate into teeny tiny little alveoli. All of these tubes are still lined with mucous membranes, which trap pathogens and lint and dust and pollutants. And then the cilia, those hair-like extensions on the cells that line the respiratory tract, they help move the mucus blanket. Isn't that a great name? toward the mouth and the nose. So when you cough or clear your throat, go ahead, let's do that. <coughs> <clears throat> you have just swallowed a little bit of your mucus blanket and all that goo is now under attack from your digestive juices. Isn't that cool? So let's look at the alveoli. Each of these bowl-shaped structures is made of simple squamous epithelium that is highly invested with elastin fibers. Each one of our 300 million alveoli is surrounded by its own cardiovascular capillary. Gaseous exchange of oxygen from the outside air and carbon dioxide from the blood occurs through these permeable walls. That gaseous exchange is not complete. At sea level, the air we inhale is about 21% oxygen, and the air we exhale is about 16% oxygen. And that turns out to be really helpful for things like rescue breathing. As you can imagine, if the alveoli are impaired in some way or not functioning correctly, the body cannot make an efficient trade of fresh air for used air, and we run into a lot of problems. One of the things that happens with COPD is that the elastin in the alveoli and the bronchioles begins to break down, and so the lungs lose their ability to rebound or snap back to their original shape. And one way to think about this is with balloons. So here, a fresh new balloon is super elastic. When we fill it with air and let it go, <laughs> whoops, um, the elasticity in the balloon pushes that air out pretty quickly while making a funny noise. 
By contrast, if we have an old used balloon, this balloon has been inflated and, and uh, tied off for several days, so it's a little stretched out. It's so like this one, then what we find is the air moves out of it much more slowly. Pulmonologists and respiratory therapists talk a lot about lung volumes and the ratio of lung volumes in different parts of the breathing cycle. And this is actually pretty easy to understand. So I'm gonna share it with you here for the sake of vocabulary. The amount of air a person inhales and exhales with a normal unstressed breath. That's our tidal volume. Just think of the air entering and leaving like waves in the tide. The amount of air we can inhale beyond a normal inhalation, try that. That is our inspiratory reserve volume or our inspiratory capacity. The amount of air we can voluntarily exhale beyond our normal breath is our expiratory reserve volume. Try that too. And feel those internal intercostals and the transversus abdominis compressing the thoracic cavity. When we add tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve plus expiratory reserve this is how much air we can voluntarily move in and out. This total is called our vital capacity. But wait, there's more. Because even when you have exhaled as much as ever you can, there's still air left in your lungs. We need it to keep the alveoli inflated and not collapsed. This little bit of air left is called our residual volume. So when we add up all of those components, we get our TLC, our total lung capacity. Various lung problems, including COPD and asthma and pulmonary fibrosis and some others, have specific signatures in the ratios that exist between these volumes, and this is why spirometry, which measures these volumes, is a really important diagnostic tool. The mechanics of breathing are really amazing. We breathe about 12 to 20 times per minute when we're at rest. The lungs themselves have no muscle tissue to expand or contract. They're just limp walled sacs that inflate or deflate according to air pressure inside them and outside them. A change in air pressure for the lungs, as opposed to for balloons, is brought about by a change in the shape of the thoracic cavity. If the cavity is made larger, then air pressure in the lungs is low until air rushes in to equalize it. In other words, the act of inhaling is just filling a vacuum. Lots of muscles are involved in this process, but here's a short synopsis. Think of your lungs as two rooms, and these rooms have ceilings, and walls and floors. And when we inhale, muscles make the rooms bigger. The floor drops down, that's the diaphragm pressing down, and the walls push out, that's the external intercostals lifting the ribs, and the ceiling rises, that's the scalenes pulling up on the top two ribs. And when all of this happens at the same time, then the thoracic cavity gets way bigger which causes the internal air pressure to drop. Air rushes in to fill it. Try it and see. Now we're gonna try something a little weird. I want you to try to contract all of those muscles that you would use to inhale, the intercostals, the diaphragm, the scalenes, but don't let any air in. And then I want you to hold that for a few seconds and then relax, unblock your air passages, and feel the air rush in. I'm gonna show you what that looks like, which makes me look like an idiot, but that's a sacrifice I'm willing to make for you. You ready? Okay, again, we're gonna contract the muscles of inspiration, but we're not gonna let any air in. We're gonna hold that for a moment, and then we'll relax and feel the air rushing to fill the vacuum that we've created. Are you ready? Here we go. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. 
Okay, let's go, let's go back to some normal breathing. At the peak of a typical normal inhalation, the air pressure inside and out the lung and outside of the lungs is about equal. And this triggers a reflex to relax our inhaling muscles so that air eases out again. And that is exhalation. Exhalation is mostly passive. And it happens because the elastic connective tissue fibers in the lungs, that elastin, pulls them back to their original size. So normal exhalation should not involve muscular activity unless a person invests extra effort to remove air from the lungs. And the efficiency of this system is amazing. As you sit here watching this video, if you're a healthy person, you're cre you, you are bringing in enough oxygen to feed every cell in your body. And you're investing only 5% of your resting energy in the act of breathing. People who have COPD have alveoli that are a lot like this stretched out old balloon. In fact, the, the alveoli enlarge, they join together to make these sort of larger pockets, but they have way less functioning elastin, so air doesn't leave the lungs without extra effort. One of the ways we track COPD, COPD progress is by looking at that expiratory reserve volume. So uh, thanks for joining me for this little review of respiratory function. It's one of my favorite things to talk about. And now you are ready to go and read more about COPD pathophysiology and the best ways that we can help our clients who live with this condition. I hope you enjoy it. And before you leave, I hope you take a nice, deep, gratitude-filled breath for the miracle of a healthy respiratory system. <laughs>